There's a fantasy about analog that I really believe is a fantasy. And, you know, it's this whole thing about tape. Oh, it sounds so much better when you record on tape. Believe me, been there, done that. It's not better. It was a pain <laughs> then, and it's still a pain. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Hello, rock stars. It's Lid Shaw, your host for Recording Studio Rockstars, the show bringing you inside the recording studio. I created this show to introduce you to real world recording professionals to hear their stories and learn from their experiences so that you can take your records to the next level and be a rock star of the recording studio yourself. My guest today is Bobby Osinski, a producer, mixer, podcaster, and author. Bobby has a long list of credits that include surround mixing for household names like The Who, Thin Lizzy, Todd Rundgren, Dead Kennedys, Mel Torme, The Kinks, and Pantera. And Bobby's production credits include Amon Tobin, Jerry Groom, Mick Taylor, and Joe Houston, to name a few. And he recently produced and mixed the number two album on the Billboard Blues chart, which is awesome. Bobby has taken his years of experience and connections in the studio and distilled all this knowledge into books, blogs, and podcasts. He's a prolific author and has written 23 books that are now staples in the audio recording, music, and music business programs in colleges around the world, including the best-selling Mixing Engineer's Handbook, The Recording Engineer's Handbook, and Music 4.0, A Survival Guide for Making Music in the Internet Age. Bobby has multiple blogs about music production with millions of views and is a contributor to Forbes writing about the music business. His podcast, Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle, is one of my favorites. He shares tips and insights for musicians about recording and the state of the music industry, followed by interviews with many of the great minds in music production. And for you, rock stars, Bobby has created something truly awesome to help you with your mixing, an online coaching program called 101 Mixing Tricks, Big Studio Tricks for the Small Studio. He took all the tricks and secrets used on many hit records by the A-list mixers and condensed them into short, easy-to-understand videos, giving you techniques that you can use for your mixing right now. So stay tuned, because coming up later on the show, Bobby also has a special offer for you, rock stars. So please welcome our guest, Bobby Osinski. Bobby, are you ready to rock, my friend? Yeah, you bet I am, Lidge. Thanks for having me. Awesome, man. I'm really so excited to have you on this show. I've been listening to your podcast and, and loving it. And like I said to you moments ago, hearing your voice on the podcast and, and then just having you here now is, is pretty awesome. Well, thanks. It's awesome for me to be here with you. Uh, so, Bobby, I've done my best to give a long-winded introduction to uh, our listeners. Can you tell us a little bit more about who you are and you know how you got into all this? <laughs> oh, it's a long story. I was a musician like everybody else who's in the recording business, virtually everyone else. And I was actually a pro. In other words, I toured with a lot of people. And I started, you know, playing clubs like everybody else. But I, I grew up in the good times, so there was a lot of clubs that you can play in. So by the time I was 16, I was playing four nights a week, and, you know, which is unheard of today. And actually making money. I was making more money than a lot of people, a lot of adults that were working 40-hour weeks. You know, so that's how I started as a player. And I continue to be a player. But in the meantime, I got a degree in electronics because I wanted to know where all the electrons were going between my guitar and the amplifier. And after I kind of figured that out, I got into recording with my own four-track at home, which is a big deal at the time. Nothing now, but back then it was. And uh, just kind of went from there. Uh, my band signed a major label deal. And then the cruel realities hit me. When you first go into a studio, see, it's different now because everybody grows up with lots of recording devices that are fairly inexpensive to get. I mean, everybody has it on their computer. You have GarageBand, you have any number of things. But back then, the only way you could record was to go into a real multi-track studio. So you never really knew what you sounded like. And I must say, the first time I went into the major New York studio and heard the first playback, I was just 
dumbfounded at how mediocre I was as a player. Wow, so that must have been sort of um, a shocking feeling. But it probably sounded fantastic though, right? It sounded pretty good, not as good as it should have at the time. And that was impetus for me to want to be a producer and, and to get my engineer chops together. You know, just to make matters worse, when the record finally came out, my parts were wiped from most of the oh, tracks. No. So it was a hard reality that I found, you know, right in the beginning of my career, which is basically, wow, you're not as good as you think you are. So you had been playing all those gigs and, and getting your chops together and really thought you had it had something special until you got in there and heard it under a microscope? Well, when you're playing in clubs, it's distinctly different than when you're playing in the studio, as you well know. In the studio, as you say, everything's under a microscope. And the parts generally are perfect. They're less perfect back then, but they're still you know, pretty good. And uh, when you're in a club, there's lots of room, <laughs> lots of leeway to be sloppy. And of course, everybody is to a certain degree. So uh, especially back then. So that was a big part of it. But, you know, the good thing was it really kicked me in the pants to get as good as I can. I, I never became a great player. I became, you know, pretty good. I never call myself great. But I wasn't even that <laughs> when I first started, even though I thought I was. <laughs> so that was impetus. And also, it kind of pushed me into recording as well. Because again, that first record we did wasn't all that great. And the sound wasn't all that great, as much as I thought it should be. You know, so I wanted to find out why. And I wanted to get some chops together. So that was a big part, you know. So it's always funny how your life goes, where sometimes things that are least attractive <laughs> in your life in terms of how your career is going Sometimes it seems like a, a real down period, but sometimes that's also the best for you because if you're willing to hang in there and learn from it, you really get a lot better. It's really true. Yeah. You know, it's sort of funny. You're sort of answering questions before I even get to them, one of which would have been to ask you about an important failure along the way. And it sounds like you're describing that, that experience of going in, discovering that you maybe had a long way to go and then Rather than getting discouraged by that, you stayed on the path and kept going with it. Yeah, I went to Berkeley as a result. And I went there as a student. And within a couple of semesters, they asked me to become a teacher as well in the recording department because I had lots of recording experience by that time. I was lucky in that the label that we were assigned to had a studio, had several studios actually. And they allowed me to record the demos of their songwriters. So I got, you know, some pretty good chops together. I was good at recording. I wasn't particularly good at mixing, but I was really good at recording. So, you know, that really came in handy later. So when I went to Berkeley, I knew more than just about anybody there. And I had real world experience. So it didn't take long before they asked me to become an instructor. So for one semester anyway, I was a teacher and I was a student and that never works out. So at the end, I just decided, eh, I think I'll just teach for a while. If you don't mind my asking, what was year was this that you were teaching at Berkeley? It would have been um, 78, 79. Okay. I was in the neighborhood in a suburb not far from Boston at that time, but certainly not ready to be a student at Berkeley yet. It was an interesting time. That's all I can say, but it probably is all the time. I, you know, I'm not one for nostalgia. I don't look back and say, wow, those are the days. It was so much better then because I, I don't really believe that. I believe today is the best it's ever been. And our world just keeps on evolving. And especially our musical world, our technical world, it keeps on evolving. Some things are, are worse for it, but most of the things are a lot better. So I prefer to look at things that way. You know, like for instance, there's a fantasy about analog that I really believe is a fantasy. And, you know, it's this whole thing about tape. Oh, it sounds so much better when you record on tape. Believe me, been there, done that. It's not better. It was a pain <laughs> then, and it's still a pain. It's even a worse pain. And I'll give you an example. I did an album a few years ago on tape, and mostly at the insistence of the artist. And it was horrible. I don't think it sounded that much better. And the real bad part, as I, so I was a producer on this, and what happens is, and this happened several times, the band is really hot. You want one more take, and you know one more take is going to be it. Uh, it's a four-minute song. There's three minutes and 50 seconds left on the reel. 
So you have oh, to. Yeah, I remember that. You have to roll it off and then take the reel off and find another one and put it on and roll it up again. And there's at least 10 minutes gone in the meantime. So the band loses its fire. That's no good. Yeah, no, I, under, I understand. And I, I feel like jumping in to uh, let you know, I just listened to your interview with Joe Ciccarelli, which was fantastic. Oh, thank you. And I know through secondhand about a session that Joe was on where he uh, had the assistant always take the reels of tape and rather than be tails out, he made sure that they were wound heads out so that in that moment that you're describing right there, all they had to do was pop a reel of tape off and immediately put one up and it was ready to thread onto the tape heads and you didn't have to do that whole long process of rewinding the tape from the take up reel back to the supply side before you could press record again. Well, that's smart. Uh, the real problem here was the fact that tape is very expensive right now. So the artist didn't know how much, and, and I didn't know either for that matter, you know, how much we'd need because, you know, band is fairly tight and you always think you need less than you actually do. And it comes down to all of a sudden, oh, I think we need another reel because we don't have enough. And, mm -hmm. you know, luckily the studio had, you know, some blank reels, but, you know, again, we didn't anticipate we'd need that much. And, you know, it's really expensive. It added a bunch onto the, the bill. And frankly, I don't see the worth of it. Now, going through a nice big Trident console, a nice big TSM, now that was worth it. Now, that kind of analog, <laughs> yeah. hey, I'll take every day. But as far as the tape is concerned, eh, I don't know. And, and, you know, it goes for like tape emulators. When, when you get tape in emulator plugins, they just don't do anything for me personally because I remember what it was like. And it wasn't that good, the stuff that tape did, you know, to me. So I, I don't know. I'm not nostalgic at all. So I haven't seen any true tape emulator plugins yet try and mimic that experience of running out of tape and then having to take 10 minutes out of your, your tracking schedule to rewind a new reel on. Thank God. Well, here, here, here's the other thing. So you got the vocalist, you got a guitar player doing an overdub, whatever it is. Oh, that was really good. Let's do another one. Oh, wait, we don't have any more tracks left. Mm -hmm. You have to track share and, oh, wait, there's no more that we can share on. Well, something has to go. And, you know, that stuff just doesn't cut it anymore. I'm sorry. Are there any positives to that tape experience? For example, the process of, you know, the musical process, how it might have been different during that experience than it might be when you have endless tracks without limits? Well, I do try to limit this, but one of the bad parts about the way we record today is you do have endless tracks and people want to use them all. <laughs> So you find that all of a sudden you're doing, you know, three tracks of, of a guitar. I mean, you're recording three and the guitar player wants to do five different parts and wants to double and triple it. And, you, you know, after a while, I mean, you have to say no at a certain part and say, well, look, it's just not getting any better. It's getting different. It's not getting better. So, you know, that's the whole thing where people think, well, we've got lots of tracks. So, you know, let's keep on going where at least when you have a limitation on tracks, it made you think ahead. And, and I'm sure the other engineers, producers, classic guys that come from my era will tell you the same thing. It, just having that limitation on you was actually better because it forced you to make decisions up front and forced you to work with the arrangement to get that right before you even you know, delved into anything else. So, you know, that was a big part of it. Yeah, I agree with that. I think the limitation of just a limitation period is a good word when it comes to art. I've always felt like art exists within boundaries and limitations, and it's how you push those limitations that is where people really get creative. One of the things that I did is I grew up on 8-track, and I really believe that that should be what most people should learn on a hard limitation of eight tracks. Because if you can make things work on eight tracks, then you can do anything, basically. And, you know, that means, okay, if you want stereo drums, no problem, but it means you're going to have less tracks for something else. So it makes you think it through before you actually go and do things. And I think that's important, and it's really good to having a very um, efficient session. Well, in the end, you only need two tracks if you're going to listen to it in stereo. One of the best records I ever did was direct a two-track, actually. It was um, Once in a Blue Moon with Jerry Groom. 
Oh, cool. It was the first record made in the studio that we were in. It was Sonora Recorders, which has been around for quite a while. But this was the first one. The, the studio was just being finished, being built in there. Their 24 track had not been delivered yet. So we had all the musicians booked and some were in from out of town and we basically had to do it. And we did it direct to dat. And it was dynamite. It was terrific because we just knew we had to get it right. <laughs> you know, so it was basically all done live and it was dynamite. Same thing for me, my band in St. Louis, one of our favorite records we ever did was just live to dat just mixed down through a little Mackie mixer straight to the DAT machine. And we couldn't get hung up on any of the other stuff. So it had to be all about performance and energy. I just did a record. Um, I'm not going to mention the act, but where it just got out of hand with tracks. And, you know, I'm as much at, at fault for letting that happen, to be honest with you. But, you know, it's all of a sudden you have 120 tracks <laughs> and you don't need that many. And it's just, you know, experimentation where you have six guitars that are basically playing the same thing. And, you know, it's hard as a producer to say no, because you want the artist to experiment and you want the artist to feel creative. So you have to let it go to a certain, at least to a certain part. But when it was all said and done, it became a monstrosity of a production that after all sorts of weeping and gnashing of teeth, we decided to scrap and redo it. And redo it in, you know, leaner and meaner. It just goes to show you, you can do all that, but you're not always, you know, really getting ahead by doing it. Yeah, I've noticed that sometimes there's a tendency in the studio for people to stop paying attention. You know, and it's when everybody's really focused and paying attention that a lot of the best stuff gets made and people start really noticing when they've got the right take or they've already got enough overdubs on a track I mean, have you been in the studio and you've ever, ever seen where somebody's out there singing on a microphone and they're kind of half doing it and everybody in the control room's got their cell phones out and they're checking their email. <laughs> and I look around and I think to myself, what's going on here? Why is everybody here in the studio unless you're here to be uber focused and making this music in this moment? Um, I have to admit, I haven't seen as much of that as you would expect most of the people I've worked with have been pretty focused, as their band has. And generally speaking, if they're going to do that, they're not in the control room. And maybe it's because I encourage that. So, that, I mean, that could be a part of it as well. But I really don't see too much of that. Everybody is pretty focused, for better or for worse. Sometimes it's better if they're not, frankly, because, you know, lets the producer do things without interference. I, interference is the wrong word. Too many opinions. Yeah, that's true. Sometimes it's good if the producer gets to focus and anybody else who doesn't have to make a decision, they can go look on their phone if they need to. Yeah. Well, so Bobby, let me ask you this. Can you share with us um, something, you know, a time in your career where you had a real moment of success, something that was just really exciting for you where you felt like it all came together? The best thing I can say is the most recent success is always the most fun and the one that sticks out. True. So like, for instance, the Adrienne Marie and her Blues Cutters project that was on Billboard. It was number two. That was in August. And I really got a kick out of that because, you know, it was a while since I've had something like that, that high in the charts. And the funny thing is it was recorded two years previously. It took that long to actually hit the charts. And as a result, it was a real kick because, you know, you expect things to happen within, you know, first month or six weeks when you release something, actually sooner these days. So to have it happen two years after the fact is pretty cool. Yeah, sometimes you have to be very patient in the music business to uh, see the results come together. Yeah, in this case, what it was, it was a new record label that came on, and they pushed it hard, and they were really good at it. So all those people that, that are in uh, do-it-yourself mode, there's a certain time and place for that. But boy, when you have a label that's working for you, there's nothing like it. Well, and I think you made a great point. You just used a really important term. You said they pushed it hard. And it's a reminder to everybody that even when you're pushing that hard, it could take two years for it to arrive at where its destination is on the chart like that. I've made some great records that never made a dent anywhere. And, you know, a big part of it is you have to get the right people working with you, the right team. Mm -hmm. And that's easier said than done. Even, you know, when you have a, a label deal and a major label deal, you can't always get people on board for what you do. 
And sometimes it's timing. Sometimes they're just not into it. Sometimes, you know, there's so many factors that go into it. So when the stars line up for that to happen, you know, you have to enjoy it and you have to go with it because it doesn't happen that often. So what did you do to celebrate? Was there a moment of just sort of celebration for you guys? No, it was private elation. <laughs> not, <laughs> nothing more than that. It was just, wow, look at this. This is so cool. Well, that's awesome, man. I, I've had, you know, a handful of smaller moments, nothing reaching number two on the billboard chart, that's for sure. But um, it's nice when you have those moments. Sometimes it's funny, you know, the moment comes and you're you're glad for it. And then you're just like ready to do the next thing too. You know, you're when you reach a goal like that, sometimes your next move is just to sort of set a new goal. Yeah, I think that's true. I don't think there's any way around that. It's part of that creative drive, you know, yeah. to keep doing stuff. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that and your experience. You know that I know when you finish a record, sometimes there's a, a jubilation at the end of a record. And then there's that little bit of letdown sometimes before you get to the next record. Well, in many cases, it's uh, elation that it's over, that you don't have to hear it anymore. I hate to say it, but, <laughs> you know, the fact of the matter is, there's just, uh, you're hearing it so, so much. And then, you know, especially if you mix it as well, I try to mix everything I do, although not exclusively. But, you know, there again, you, you kind of elongate the process when you're mixing it because then your head is in it for another couple of weeks, listening and listening and listening. Can you talk a little bit about your mix process these days? What's your studio look like? What are you mixing on? Oh, God. It's way, way, way scaled back. Uh, once again, I have no nostalgia for the past. I always hated console automation. I like the fact that you can automate stuff. I just thought the way it worked wasn't user-friendly to me anyway. Yeah, it was like the precursor to mixing with a mouse. Yeah, and you know, so many of my contemporaries anyway still complain about mixing with the mouse. I thought it was the most wonderful thing. <laughs> I can go in and draw in automation and I can do it in a flash instead of having to sit there and, and go through you know 10 iterations till you get it right on a fader. So I'm perfectly happy to mix with the mouse. And um, as a result, I just have a small setup, you know, Pro Tools, a couple of big monitors, that's about it. And, uh, you know, good sounding interface. And it's not elaborate anymore. It doesn't have to be. No outboard gear, none of that stuff. And I'm perfectly happy with it. And the results are really good. No one's complaining. So I guess that's all right. Well, you had an advantage. You were probably able to take a look at your 101 mixing tricks tutorial and learn how to mix on it. <laughs> well... You know, what's interesting with that is the way that came about, and actually the way my writing career came about was because I was a poor mixer. I was not good. I was good at recording, but I just wasn't a good mixer. And part of the reason why was I wasn't around good mixers to really get a reference point. The one thing I did know is I knew all the best guys in LA anyway, and a lot of, a lot of them in New York. So I thought, well, if I want to know some of these things, some of these tricks. I bet there's a lot of other people as well. So I went and I interviewed, I guess it was 25 different, you know, again, A-list mixers, all sorts of different genres. And then I wrote the Mixing Engineer's Handbook. Didn't have a publisher. I just wrote it. And I sent it out to five different publishers and all five bit. And I went for the one that was most aggressive, Mike Lawson. He's been my champion in that part of the business. I followed him from publisher to publisher to publisher. And he's the person that, you know, always steered me in the right direction. And, you know, it's so nice to have somebody like that because we all need it. Let's face it. Well, especially if you have a plan to write 23 books in your career, oh, <laughs> then you God. definitely need it. There was never that plan. It was just to write the first one. And anybody that writes a book, especially their first one, they'll tell you the same thing. I'm never going to do that again. And so many brain cells die in the process. But it turns out that the Mixing Engineer's Handbook was a hit right, right out of the box because there wasn't anything like it at the time. So the publisher is after me, write another one, write another one. So I thought, okay, how about recording? And I did the same thing. I just duplicated it and then mastering. And then it was your Rocky two and your Rocky three. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I was lucky in that they were hits as well, which they're all like that, but most of them have, have sold, you know, fairly well. But it turns out that I want to learn something myself. That's first and foremost. And I kind of figure if I want to learn these things, hopefully there's a whole bunch of other people that feel the same way. 
So that's first and foremost. But after a while, it also became something of historical proportions. What I mean by that is, you know, the way that we learn about audio is distinctly different than the way it used to be. It used to be that, of course, you started, you know, as low on the totem pole in a studio, in a real commercial recording studio, and you worked your way up. And as you became an assistant, then you were able to watch hopefully all the best engineers, or at least better than you, as well as producers, and be able to take some from each and leave some behind from each. Well, that's all changed because there's fewer and fewer of those types of studios around. And we all get our knowledge from other things. We get it from online, from YouTube, from books, from courses, whatever. It's not the same thing. So one of the things I wanted to do is capture some of the industrial knowledge that some of the great engineers of our time have. It doesn't kind of flow out into the ether, <laughs> you know, disappear away. So a lot of it is from a historical standpoint. I just want to capture that wisdom that certainly I don't have. Everybody's a lot smarter in the books than I am, that's for sure. But I, I hope to capture their wisdom, you know, so years later we can all look back and go, wow, okay, yeah, I get it now. Wow, that's another way to look at it. You're an archivist of sorts. Yeah, well, I like to think of myself like that. I don't know if anybody else does, but I, I like to think of myself. Sort of like and now, have, has your writing evolved more towards that, where you recognize the importance of that after you'd written your first few books? You know, for example, one of your books is Abbey Road to Ziggy Stardust, and I wondered if you could introduce us to that for just a moment. Oh, that was such a great project. Uh, I didn't, you know, it's funny, because I've kind of run into everybody of any kind of import in the recording business, you know, over my time in L.A., except for Ken Scott. I just never ran into him anywhere. So when my publisher came to me with the idea of writing something with him, I jumped at the chance because, first of all, he's one of the five Beatle engineers. There's only five of them. Uh, you know, so <laughs> there's that. And plus he did Bowie. He did, um, you know, all the big English bands of the time. So I just wanted to find out more about what he did and how he did it. So this was such a great experience. First of all, Ken's a lovely man, and we just had a great time together. But, you know, of course, some of the things are going back 40 years, some of the, his remembrances, and he didn't always get it right. Or he couldn't always remember the whole picture. So he'd say to me, well, talk to so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so and, -so and, -so and see what they remember. So I wound up talking to all these people that were there back in the day. And after a while, I, I almost began to feel like I was there, too. You know, I, <laughs> wow. Wow. From the standpoint that there was so much information coming and I had a much better picture of what was happening, a mental picture. Maybe it was completely wrong, but in my mind, you know, I felt like I was there in so many ways, vicariously through these people. So, Well, so what was one of the craziest things that happened back then? Well, okay, here's the one thing that really stands out that's just wild. So Ken worked, after he worked at Abbey Road, he worked at Trident Studios, which was the big independent place, one of the big independent places at the time. And it turns out, now, I come from a small town in Pennsylvania, 5,000 people. That's it. Mm -hmm. And the chances of me ever, you know, making a career in the music business were almost nil. But it turns out that a guy that I knew that was actually a roadie for one of my bands became a roadie for another band that recorded at Trident just about the same time that Ken was recording. So I happened to run into him and I told him that I was doing this book with Ken Trident and everything. He said, gee, I think I took some pictures back then. He rummages through, you know, his pictures. And sure enough, he comes up with like four of them of Trident at the time. Wow, that's cool. What's the chance? But it, it gets even cooler because one of them has Ken in it. But it turns out that he's taking it from in front of the console looking backwards and, you know, there's Roy Thomas Baker and there's Ken and there's somebody else I don't remember. Behind him, there's a 16 track. So I show Ken the picture and he says, well, that's me and that's Roy, but I don't remember that 16 track ever being there. So what do you mean? He says, well, that studio never had a 16 track in there. So the next thing you know, he's calling everybody that he knew had tried and trying to find out just for his curiosity. And it turns out that for that one particular session and that one day, they brought the 16 track in. 
Ken never knew about it. He never realized it while he was there, but it was just making him crazy trying to figure this out. You know, so here we go. What are the chances that this picture would be taken by a friend of mine, you know, back in whatever it was, 70, whatever, four or five, something like that. Uh, it's mind boggling. So it was one of those things that happened that was just, you know, crazy. That's funny. I mean, you literally were there vicariously at that time through a yeah. friend. That's about as close as you get, you know? Well, you know, talking to everybody about some of the Beatles sessions were, were cool. You know, all the songs that we still hear today and love and just hearing kind of the inside story on them was, was great. It's, it's uh, experience I'll forever treasure, I must say. And then to make it even better, I was producing a band shortly after the book came out. And I'm not one of the, these people that could record a you know track as an engineer and be a producer at the same time. I just don't do well with that. I can do overdubs, but I just rather concentrate on being a producer. So I usually hire somebody that's really good, hopefully better than I am to come in and engineer. So I call up Ken and I said, Ken, <laughs> this is beneath you, I know, but would you do this? Would you come in and track? He said, yeah, sure. I'm not doing anything. So here's Ken Scott, one of the five Beatle engineers, producer David Bowie, producer Supertramp, on and on and on. And he's engineering for me. He's doing basics. Wow. And well, the cool part was I wanted to see what he did because he was using all the same tricks that he used you know, way back then at Abbey Road. And one of the best parts was it was verification. It's like, oh, you know, I do it like that too. And it's like, oh, okay. Yeah, I guess I was always right then. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's awesome. But the one thing from the session I do remember that was really cool and was really embarrassing at the same time. We're in Total Access Studios, Redondo Beach, which Ken had worked in for 25 years. So they had all the mics that he wanted and all the setup and everything. And we're recording a bass amp. So he goes out and he gets a C12, which you'd never think to use on a bass amp. And he looks at me as he's setting it up and he says, this is what I used to use on Paul, meaning Paul McCartney. <laughs> nice. So I'm thinking to myself, oh, I bet this sounds good. Before we could even hear it, the stupid bass player comes in and says, what are you doing? Nobody ever does that. Here, use a, a, a B-52 or, a, and he's naming all these other mics that you should be using. And I'm kicking him. I'm saying, do you realize who this is? This is Ken Scott. And the stupid bass player was just so oblivious to this whole thing. Needless to say, it sounded great. <laughs> you know, yeah, really. It really worked well. It was not something I ever would have thought of, and most other people wouldn't either. But, you know, again, that was part of the experience. It was just wonderful. It would have been funny if the bass player had followed it up with saying, you know, I don't want to use that. I really want to go for more of a Paul McCartney tone. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Well, so Bobby, I have a question from one of our listeners, one of the rock stars. So it's, it's a little technical, but he, it's, this comes from Rob Wise, uh, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Rob, I hope so. And he says, his question to you is, my recordings are a struggle with peaking, then it's way too quiet. Is there a beginner's resource you recommend? And I didn't want to rephrase the question. I figured I'd just give it to you straight up and, and see what your answer might be. Well, if it's peaking, meaning... It's overloading. That's not good. So you have to back everything off so it doesn't do that. I wouldn't worry if it's getting really quiet because you can fix that when you mix with compression. Especially now with the tools we're using. Maybe back when you first went into the studio, that might have been more of an issue with noise floor and stuff. Yeah. And even the early days of digital recording, it was an issue when we were at, you know, at 8-bit and then just 16-bit. That was an issue. And now we're, it's not so much. But that being said, so many of the classic engineers that I know have recorded with compression and aren't afraid to use it when they're recording. Now, obviously, you have to know what you're doing because, you know, you can really wreck something and not be able to fix it later. But so many of the great songs that you've heard in the 60s and 70s were recorded with lots of compression on it. And, you know, we were just talking about Ken Scott. That's one of the things I learned, that the Beatles always double compress things. They compressed it hard awesome. when they were recording and compressed it when it was going to uh, mix. So, um, and they weren't afraid. And I'd say, well, how much are you using on recording? And he'd look at me and say, well, as much as it needed. He says, sometimes it was 2 dB, sometimes it was 15. He says, well, whatever it needed. And it's just that back then, everybody kind of had a reference point of what sounded good. So... They just did whatever they had to. That's awesome. So you look at you look at Ken and you're saying, really? You're just 
listening and enjoying it and just having fun? You're not yeah. thinking this too hard? Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I guess, you know, what I would say is don't record with compression if you're not sure. One of the easy ways to start is just add a dB or two just to control the peaks. And you'll find that happens with a lot of engineers will do that on, you know, a lot of their tracks. A lot of it has to do with the players because really good studio players know how to maintain their volume level. And they know that the more consistent they can be with one level, the better it will sound for the most part. When you have players that aren't studio-wise, so to speak, then you'll have levels that are going up and down a lot. Again, it's, sometimes it works with the track and you want it to be dynamic, and other times it doesn't work. The easiest thing is to get a player or make the player aware that you want a consistency in dynamics. Easiest way. Yeah, and then I think we should also point out this listener may or may not have an outboard, a physical compressor, which is what you're describing for the recording process. If you don't have a physical compressor, you can use one, you know, when you're mixing, but it's not necessarily going to help your peaks on the way in. And and in that case, I guess all you've got left to do is just simply turn down your gain. Just bring it down a little bit if you're getting overloads. Yep, that's it. Well, so Bobby, we're nearing the end of our interview, and I would like to um, kind of jump into the jam session with you. But before I do, I was hoping you could tell our listeners a little bit more about your 101 mixing tricks. And you had also generously offered a special for these guys that they might want to know about how, how they can go check it out. Yeah, 101 mixing tricks is just as it sounds, it's 101 videos on different parts of the mix. And, and they're, they're tricks. They're tricks that I've learned from my years in the studio, especially hanging with some of the best engineers with the Dave Pensados and Elliot Chiners and, and Ken Scotts and guys like that, where I just picked these tricks up. I've been collecting them for years. So there's actually 115 videos in the course, in the program broken down into five modules. One is just on effects, for instance, using delay, using reverb in interesting ways. Some ways make it stick out of the track and other ways make it blend in. And then there's one just for instruments, making them interesting in the mix. And there's one just for drums and percussion. Again, making drums punchy, making them big and fat, making them sound special. Then there's another module that's just about vocals, lead and background vocals, and again, making them special. And it's a lot of things that you probably have heard on records but haven't thought of or don't, didn't know how to get. And then finally, there's a module on things like automation, balance, panning, compression, EQ. And again, just some little tricks to help you mix along. So that's 101 mixing tricks. And there's also a bunch of other bonuses that I've included for instance, there's four videos that are just on editing, and it's all the editing prep that virtually every, every mixer does when they get a mix in. You know, a lot of them will take a day or even two to go through and prep the track for mixing, and that means getting rid of all the clicks and pops, making the um, releases all work together, getting rid of pops and, and, and getting rid of uh, overloads, things like that. So that's something that I haven't seen anywhere but I've included it in this as well. So it's 115 different videos that's in the 101 Mixing Tricks so far, and I keep on adding them. I want to jump in and also make a comment on them because I've seen your videos, and I want our listeners to know that your ability to present these concepts and teach so that anybody can watch these, understand it, learn it, and use it right away, it's just, it's unparalleled. You're just such a good teacher, Bobby. So thank you for creating all that. Anyone who's listening, if you want to sample, you can get four mixing tricks that are very cool. Some of the best ones, actually. You can get them for free. Just go to 101mixingtricks.com and just sign in and I'll send you the tricks. And there's other ones. I'll, I'll give you four right off and there's some other ones that will come afterwards that you can see. But um, you can get a taste for everything. There is one in particular that everybody loves in there. It's the Abbey Road Reverb Trick. And this came out of my book with Ken Scott, Abbey Road and Ziggy Stardust, finding out exactly what their trick to make their reverbs sound as good as they do. That's awesome. You can use that in your mixes too. I'm, I'm looking forward to it, man. That is really cool.
Hey, it's Lidge, and I hope you're digging this episode with Bobby Osinski. And I just want to remind you that if you're looking for ways to take your mixes, not only to the next level, but to the level after that, and the level after that, and the level after that, you've got to check out 101 Mixing Tricks, big studio tricks for the small studio. It's totally awesome. I highly recommend it. And I will have a link to it directly in the show notes for you. And not only that, but Bobby has set up a special discount coupon just for you, rock stars. Look for it in the show notes at rsrockstars.com slash 10. See you guys in the jam session. Cheers. Well, Bobby, thank you so much. Let's jump right into the jam session. Yeah. If we can. And, and uh, I'll ask you a few more questions and let you go on your way. So, Bobby, tell us at the beginning of doing all this, what was holding you back, whether it was for music or whether it was part of your recording career or, or maybe when you got into authoring books? Probably ego. hate to say it, but yeah. Again, thinking I was better than I was. It's a big slap of reality when you <laughs> really find out how good you are, because so few of us are, are geniuses and brilliant, <laughs> even though we may think we are. All right, so what was some of the best advice that you received early on? Distance equals depth. Basically, if you move a microphone back from the source that you're trying to record, it will sound bigger. When you put it right up on top, the sound doesn't have a chance to develop. So if you want more depth, a little bit more distance will get you there. Uh, Do you find that in the example where maybe a guitar player is playing through their amp and they, they come into the control room and then they say, ah, it does, just why doesn't it sound like it does out there? That that's a good example of, of when distance equals depth and, and getting a mic away from the guitar amp? Yeah, it usually sounds small. Uh, and you, you get great isolation, but the big downside is, you know, you get that small sound as well. So one of the things that's interesting, if you just look at videos... Go search through YouTube and look at videos from like the Wrecking Crew or anybody, you know, from the the 60s and 70s. And you'll see that rarely is there a microphone really close to anything. And those, you know, especially in the 70s, those records still hold up. They sound terrific. And for the most part, you know, there is a fair amount of distance that they were using, that the engineers just, the way they grew up. So um, that's one of the big tricks that I learned uh, from Eddie Kramer, actually. That's cool. Yeah. Well, so uh, that kind of probably answers the next question, which was recording tip, hack, or secret sauce that you might like to share with our listeners. Yeah, that's the big one, definitely. Uh, I'll give you another one, though, in mixing. Uh, shorter delays and shorter reverbs have more of a place in mixing than you might think. And for those of you who haven't been around great mixers, you tend to use longer delays, longer reverbs, And things get muddy as a result. And you'd be surprised the number of times there's something that's very, very short that you can't hear, but you perceive, and it really makes a difference. Yeah, it becomes more of an ambient sound, like something echoing off a nearby wall. Yeah. Um, Okay, cool. So next up, how about a favorite hardware tool, Bobby? Something that's a physical item that you really like to have in the studio with you. Oh, without a doubt, an 1176. (laughs) Classic. Yeah, I mean, it it does so much still. It always sounds good, and you can always make it work for just about anything you need. So, yeah, I I always like to have at least one around. Now, there are a number of 1176 uh, clones. I don't know if that's the right word for it, but, you know, they aren't made by Yuri, but they're made by other companies. Have you found that even one that's not an original Yuri 1176 still typically tends to be a, a very useful tool in the studio? Well, guess what? You're listening to one right now. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Your voice sounds great, man. Thank you. There's a uh, WA-76 from Warm Audio that's in my signal chain right now. And you're hearing, uh, you know, 3, 4 dB of compression from it. Wow, cool. I think I just discovered that compressor, too, when I was browsing through some catalogs. What a great bargain. They really sound good. And you can't beat the price. Um, And then just a reminder to listeners, I'll make sure to include links to all these things in the show notes so you can go there and find out what some of the stuff was we talked about. Now, Bobby, how about a favorite software tool, something you really like that's inside the computer? Well, again, um, an 1176 (laughs) plug-in. 
you know, there's a bunch of go-to plugins, and they're mostly compressors that I use. Um, and DBX 160 on drums just has that sound. And LA2s, LA3s, 1176s. Uh, I'm partial to Universal Audio. been using their stuff for a long time. It always sounds great. So there's that. For reverbs, God, I just, he's going to kill me, but I can't remember the name right now. It's, <laughs> it just escaped me. But great reverbs. We can, you know what, I'll tell you what, Bobby, if you want to drop it in an email to me later, I'll make sure to still include it in the show notes. Oh, great. That'd be terrific. Um, how about a uh, a resource for the business side of, of recording, something that you would recommend? Well, I, I hate to be a self-promoter, but I really think that the Music 4.0 book is unique. And it's my book, the book that I wrote, Music 4.0. It's unique in that it not only gives you a, some history of the music business, but in a way that I don't think anybody does. Anybody, Most books don't approach it the same way. But there's also a lot of research that I did to figure out where all the money goes, why things are the way they are, especially in, in streaming. And the new version is going to be out in January, by the way. I worked really hard to figure out where every 100th, 1,000th of a penny went from a stream, for instance, or from a YouTube view. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. And I remind our listeners to listen to your podcast, too, because you, every week, are giving us some new insight into the music business side of things. And I appreciate that. Well, thanks. You know, I, again, I'm more pro business than most other people. There's a lot of doom and gloom out there about the business. And I don't look at it like that. I think we're actually on the upswing. And there's a chance it could be better than ever at a certain point in time. There's a chance. I'm not predicting it. I'm just saying, you know, things are getting better. Well, so the next one is sort of the metaphysical, you know, like uh, feel good question of the of the podcast. And it is simply this. It's hypothetical, but if you ended up in a, a new city and you didn't know anybody and you were just starting out um, and you could only take a simple setup to record, what would you take? How would you find people to record and make music? And how would you make ends meet while you were there getting started with your recording career? Oh, it's real easy, actually. I'd take um, my um, Apple laptop, the um, MacBook Pro, and uh, an Apollo Twin interface. And I have these little Equator D5 monitors that I love that really sound good. And um, a couple of microphones from Advanced Audio. Advanced Audio makes clones of the great microphones, great vintage microphones. And I could probably get by with that. How I'd find people to record, there's always a music paper in most cities, some sort of a, a paper that specializes in the music scene. So I'd find that and go where the musicians go. That means clubs, studios, rehearsal studios, and begin to meet people. Have you discovered any resources, if there aren't that many people in a particular locality, have you discovered resources for people to visit and find other musicians to record with, interact with online? There are a lot of them, but I, it, it's not that I've been using these, so I can't say I'm intimately involved. But I did have somebody on my podcast um, from Gigmore. I don't think the podcast is posted yet, but it sounds like a very interesting idea gigmore.com. It's G-I-G-M-O-R.com. And the idea is for musicians to meet other musicians and also at the particular skill levels that they need to be. And also in order to get gigs as well, uh, meet club owners and club owners who listen to bands. So uh, I thought that was an interesting idea. Right on. That's great. I love that. Yeah. Um, I had not heard of that yet, so I'm going to go check that out. Yeah. So Bobby, all right, last question. Uh, what single thing could a listener do to become a rock star of the recording studio themselves? Persistence always wins. And it wins over talent every day. Unless you are so freakishly brilliant, and there's so few that are, the people that hang in there are the ones that actually get ahead. And I've seen it throughout my career. <laughs> hey, I'm a shining example myself. So, you know, all I can say is it works. If you just, you know, love what you're doing so much that no matter what, you you keep doing it, even when things look terrible, when you're not getting paid, when you're not having fun, although I don't recommend that too much, but you hang in there. 
eventually you meet like-minded people, like-minded clients, and everybody kind of succeeds together. And that's what you'll find. You just have to hang in there. The biggest problem that many musicians, engineers, producers have is wanting success too quickly because it doesn't come quickly most of the time. And if it does, it usually means it leaves you very quickly as well. Don't they have a term for that? Isn't that called the one hit wonder? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, right. (laughs) But, you know, as they say, uh, you know, you're trying to get one fan at a time doing one gig at a time. And it's really true. It, you just have to hang in there and be persistent. And that wins over talent any day because sooner or later you'll learn enough to make yourself not only useful, but really wanted in the business and sought after. My version of that is don't take no for an answer because life and experience is going to give you so many versions of no along the way. And it's going to keep repeatedly telling you that you might just stop what you're doing and give up. Yep, that's a good one. Well, Bobby, thank you so much. What a pleasure it's been talking to you, and uh, I really appreciate you joining us on the podcast. Yeah, Lidge, I had a great time. Uh, Thank you for inviting me. How can our listeners follow you, find you, and learn more about what you're doing? Well, I got tons of websites for and blogs and things like that, but the central resource is bobbyosinski.com. And if you go there, there's links to everything, to the podcast, to all the blogs, to just about everything that I do. And uh, to the 101 Mixing Tricks course, to the Music Prosperity course, to Forbes, to the things I do on lynda.com. You know, you can all start at bobbyosinski.com. Sounds like a perfectly good place to start. And I will say that you have so much content. You're so prolific with what you've produced and shared with the world that we should all be kind to ourselves and allow ourselves to gently (laughs) absorb all this stuff that you've put out there don't have to read 23 books in one day. Start with one and, and just keep reading. You know, my blogs, one has 2,000 posts and the other one is like 1,800. So <laughs> that's, that's a lot of stuff there too. Even I can't remember what's on it. Well, I was going to ask you, Bobby, is there like a point of no return wherein you can't actually read through everything you've produced at some point? <laughs> I certainly can't remember it. And it's funny because I meet people all the time that will go, man, I love that post on XXX. And I'll go, oh, did I do that? When did I do that? Was that me? <laughs> you know, I hate to say it, but you know, it, after a while, it kind of blurs together. Were you writing blog posts before you started writing your first book? No, it kind of came as a result of uh, this new medium that we had, social media, and thinking, well, I think I have to get into this. You know, starting stupidly, starting by writing, you know, one blog post a day, which I wouldn't recommend to anybody. And then, even, even, well, even crazier, then I started a second blog, which is also writing one a day. So basically, I'm writing 10 posts a week. And believe me, that takes a lot of time. I wouldn't recommend it, but since I'm locked into doing it, <laughs> I hope you enjoy it. Wow, awesome. Well, Bobby, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. We'll see you around the studio. Thanks, Liz. Take care. Cheers. Bye bye. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444, and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music.